Good afternoon. This is all about Bitcoin, a show dedicated to all things questions and markets related to Bitcoin, little b for the currency, and Bitcoin, big B for the network, a collective journey to understand, apply, and use this innovation, all Bitcoin, all the time. And I'm your host, Christine Lee, taking a look at our top stories of the day. Paxos, the crypto custodian handling the back end for PayPal and Venmo, raising $300 million in confidence capital to expand operations. CEO Charles Casco saying that with a 2.4 billion valuation, Paxos now joins the crypto unicorn club. Another blockchain backend in separate news, Alchemy, also known as the AWS for blockchains, has raised $80 million in their latest funding round. And U.S. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell saying the markets, as exemplified by Dogecoin, are a bit frothy and that he won't say it has nothing to do with monetary policy, but it also has a lot to do with vaccinations and the economy reopening. Bitcoin's bounce from recent lows near $48,000 has stalled near 55, and so far buyers are refusing to step in despite the Fed's easy money policy decision to keep rates near zero, announced Wednesday. And Coinbase debuting its buy with PayPal feature, where you can now buy Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies with PayPal, but definitely read the fine print. The nearly 4% fee is high, but Coinbase representatives say they are necessary to cover the cost of payment processing. All right, let's take a look at Bitcoin right now. Trade blocks indexes are now the Coindex indexes, so the Coindesk Bitcoin price XBX index is currently trading just below $53,000 right now. Bitcoin is down about 3.7% over the past 24 hours. The most reliable reference prices for institutions since 2014 are now published under the Coindesk brand, trusted globally as the leader in crypto news events and data. All right, so crypto-friendly banks have been doing well amid Bitcoin's momentous surge over the past few months. Silvergate recently reported average total digital currency deposits of over $6.4 billion in their latest first quarter's earnings call. Joining us now to discuss is Silvergate Bank CEO Alan Lane. Welcome to the show, Alan. Hi, Christine. It's good to be here. Good to have you. All right, so you're based in La Jolla, California. Your service... Uh, Silvergate is serving major crypto firms such as Coinbase, Gemini, and Kraken. The banks added a record 135 digital currency customers in the first quarter, more than it added in all of 2020. I'd like to first get your outlook on Bitcoin and how it's impacted your business. Yeah, we are definitely um, bullish on Bitcoin at Silvergate and uh, have been since we first got into this business uh, back in 2014. And um, yeah, I mean, we've certainly been through many cycles and we cer uh, certainly feels that we're in a little bit of a bull market right now, but Silvergate has been providing services to customers in this industry uninterrupted for the last seven years. And, um, and so we're just really happy to be a part of it and really um, proud to be serving the industry. Mm -hmm. So Genesis, which is the sister company to Coindesk, was saying that there's a cash deficit in the crypto space right now. Can you talk about the need for crypto-backed fiat loans in the present moment? Yeah, I'm happy to. That's, that's one of the products that Silvergate announced um, a little over a year ago is a product that we call Send Leverage, which is Bitcoin collateralized loans. And what we're essentially trying to do, you mentioned in your introduction that uh, Silvergate has deposits of over, on, on average of over $6 billion in this ecosystem. And what we're looking to do is put those deposits back into the ecosystem by lending to our existing customers who are long Bitcoin and who are looking to, to turn that Bitcoin into US dollars without necessarily having to sell the Bitcoin and perhaps incur capital gains taxes. Mm -hmm. So has the deficit accelerated your extension of crypto backed fiat loans? You know, honestly, Christine, it's a great question. Uh, it hasn't accelerated our lending activity because we're already actively engaged in providing loans collateralized by Bitcoin to this ecosystem. This is something that we started piloting a little over a year ago and have just been uh, been uh, very actively building this, this business. We announced at the end of the first quarter that we had expanded our partners 
uh, to include Coinbase Custody and Fidelity Digital Assets. That's in addition to the partners that we had announced last year, which uh, we started with Bitstamp, then we added Anchorage. So we have multiple ways for our customers to, to custody their Bitcoin and uh, to pledge that Bitcoin to us in return for a U.S. dollar-backed loan. And so um, we're just seeing steady growth across the entire customer base. Mm -hmm. In the most recent correction, some startup crypto lenders asked customers to add crypto to their accounts in case of margin calls. Is the industry in danger of being over leveraged, people buying crypto with money they don't have? Where do you think things stand? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And we keep our eyes on that quite a bit. What I will say is that for us at Silvergate, we are always over collateralized and um, certainly there's always the potential that with a um, sudden and substantial price drop in the price of bitcoin that we 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 could find ourselves in an under collateralized spot but but our intent is to always be over collateralized and so we typically start at about a 65 percent loan to value and um our our customers would typically be adding Bitcoin or paying down the loan if they get up to about the 80% loan to value range. And so what that means is, is within that range, we're, we're always over collateralized. So at least at Silvergate, we're not, you know, we don't believe that we're in danger of, of, um, of overextending credit to our mm -hmm. customer base. So Silvergate's cost of funds from the crypto industry are 0%. Do you think cheap deposits will bring other larger banks into the crypto banking business? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And we have certainly thought so uh, from, from the very early days. And that's one of the reasons that we set about to try to figure out, okay, how can we not only be more helpful to our customers, but also to to uh, create a sustainable competitive advantage for Silvergate. And we've done that through uh, what we refer to as the Silvergate Exchange Network. Uh, the rest of the industry calls it the SEN. And it's the ability for our customers not only to on-ramp and off-ramp between the US dollar and digital assets, but importantly for our customers to be able to transact with each other across our platform 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, th and that's really why um, we've been able to grow our customer base so efficiently. You mentioned at the outset that in the first quarter, we added 135 new customers. That is the um, largest uh, single quarter of um, customer growth um, that we've experienced. Our pipeline is still really strong. And it's important to note also that, that um, those are all institutional customers. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the number might sound small, um, but it's not a consumer offering. It really is institutional. And so every customer that we onboard is a business, an institution, and, um, and they keep deposits with us primarily so that they can access the, um, liquidity in the cryptocurrency markets 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're the first bank in the world to bring the legacy 24, or excuse me, the legacy 40 hour a week banking system into the 24 seven crypto market. Speaking of which, Silvergate serves as the mint and burn bank for stablecoin issuers. Where do you see use cases for stablecoins going forward? Yeah, I really appreciate that question as well. You're you're hitting all the highlights, Christine. <laughs> so with, with, with stablecoins, uh, yeah, as you mentioned right now, Silvergate is the primary um, minter and burner, if you will. Our, our, you know, we facilitate the minting and burning of um, the all of the U.S. regulated stablecoin offerings, and that's USDC, that's the Pax dollar, um, the Gemini dollar, and True USD. Um, every single one of those issuers uses Silvergate and, and the SEN and our API platform in the minting and burning process. Um, but the primary use case for those stable coins currently is for trading of crypto assets. And um, where we really see the opportunity in the future is, is for commerce, for, um, for cross-border payments, for remittance, et cetera. And um, certainly USDC is making great strides in that area mm -hmm. and we're happy to partner with them in, in that regard. But going forward, you've, you've seen many announcements from other large players who are looking at potentially offering um, a US dollar backed stablecoin and Silvergate provides critical infrastructure to the ecosystem. And so we're in many of those conversations and we're looking forward to helping um, the, the industry um, with stablecoins 
any way we can. Really quickly, Alan, 30 seconds, but are you talking to central banks? There's the U.S. digital dollar project going on. So, um, so we are in conversations with, with many parties. Um, you know, the, the um, Federal Reserve themselves, you know, we are a state chartered uh, Fed member. So we have an ongoing dialogue with Federal Reserve. But I, I can't comment on any conversations we might be having regarding stable coins or CBDCs um, with the Fed. Um, but suffice it to say that we're really well positioned Fair enough. Uh, to, to help in that regard. Alan, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Appreciate your insights. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Christine. All right, that was Silver Bank CEO Alan Lane. Coming up, Bitcoin mining activity and analysis with investment firm Digital Finance. witnessing the greatest paradigm shift in finance in modern history. Join thousands of newsmakers and influencers talking the future of money at Consensus by Coindesk. A live virtual experience of leaders, changemakers, virtual reality meetups, keynotes from Ray Dalio, Gary Vaynerchuk, and much more. Get an up-close look at the boom in crypto, the surge of institutional investment in Bitcoin, NFT mania, the breakneck innovation in decentralized finance, and the coming disruption from central bank digital currencies. Join us May 24th to May 27th for Consensus by Coindesk. The Chart of the Day is brought to you by Crypto.com, the world's fastest growing crypto app. Bitcoin transfers from miners to crypto exchanges hitting a six and a half month low, a sign of bullish price expectations. Miners have squeezed the tabs by about 80 percent since sending a peak of an average 805 BTC to exchanges at the end of February, according to Glassnode data. Coindesk's Ankar Gaboli writing that reduced miner supply to exchanges is taken to represent bullish sentiment among those responsible for generating coins by choosing to hold on to more of their BTC now and implies miners anticipate selling them later at a higher price. Miners mainly operate on cash and are constant sellers in the market, liquidating at least some part of their holdings every day to fund operational costs. And joining us now to discuss is Maxime Nurov, CEO of investment firm Digital Finance. Welcome, Max. Thanks for joining the show. Thank you for having me. So miners are holding on to their Bitcoin rather than selling them on exchanges. Do you anticipate a push toward new highs for Bitcoin? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm fully convinced that we are in the probably in the beginning of the bull market cycle, and I expect Bitcoin price to continue growing uh, in the nearest months. And uh, my personal forecast is probably. $7,200,000 uh, by the end of the year. And um, I think it definitely makes sense for miners to wait for a while and not to sell Bitcoin now because there are uh, very high probability of the Bitcoin price appreciation uh, mm -hmm. in the near future. You know, the Fed is keeping rates unchanged in their latest policy decision. Fed Chair Jerome Powell saying the market is a bit frothy, and that might be why we're seeing spikes in Dogecoin, as well, which was created as a joke coin, and stocks like GameStop. Yet, Bitcoin has been coasting along 53 to 55 over the past week. Why aren't we seeing a big boost in Bitcoin amid news that the Fed is continuing with its easy money policy? Yes. Um, I think that um, we, we are in the uh, very unusual global macro environment when we see our uh, financial uh, instability in the local markets, uh, rising inflation in developing countries, and we just are uh, recovering from the coronavirus crisis. That's why our investors prefer to hedge and to allocate their capital to either cash gold or bitcoin or mm -hmm. other digital currencies at the mm -hmm. same time retail investors are more driven by speculative uh, motivations and that's why uh, uh, when large investors understand that bitcoin is pretty much secure and safe investments with the high potential growth uh, retail investors uh, allocate capital to 
are n not so secure and more like speculative for uh, the digital currency with more like speculative narrative. And uh, at the same time, I think that uh, this situation will change for sure because uh, the market will become more efficient and mm -hmm. uh, uh, regulate in the future. Right. You know, Coinbase is offering users the ability to pay for crypto using PayPal. The fees are huge, though. For everyday people, what is the best way to accumulate Bitcoin, in your view? Uh, yeah, it's a good future. Uh, good, uh, good question. And I think that this is one of the areas when we definitely need improvements uh, uh, because uh, currently it's pretty much easy to trade Bitcoin or any other digital assets for retail and institutional um, clients. At the same time, it's still not so easy for, let's say, for retail clients to securely store the Bitcoin because uh, it still needs some like uh, knowledge of the technology, how to store the private keys, how to set up the wallet. And I think that because of that, uh, probably still even holding Bitcoin on the largest exchange, this makes more sense uh, for retail clients. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why, yeah, I think that uh, actually it's a, a very unique market niche in the future when we need yeah. to more easier, easier, uh, 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 more, well, more, like, uh, certainly, yeah, certainly more. there's a lot of interest in Bitcoin right now. It's getting more mainstream. Uh, one of my colleagues just mentioned she went to the bathroom and a woman asked her how, how much Bitcoin should she buy. In that spirit, what kind of allocation are you recommending to retail investors who want to invest in Bitcoin? Uh, Sure. Uh, we um, we built our first of its kind um, Bitcoin robo advisor on our platform uh, Digital Finance. It's uh, website digit finance, uh, where um, any investors can uh, easily calculate the optimal allocation to Bitcoin. Uh, the service is absolutely free, and. Uh, all, all what investors need to do is to answer two simple questions. Okay. Uh, so like 1% of their tolerance. net worth or 5% or I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, it, yeah. It, uh, depends on the risk tolerance investment goals. So basically, if you have uh, high risk tolerance, uh, long-term investment goals, and you want to have probably it could be uh, up to 20% if, you, if you're a credit investor. But if you have low risk tolerance, short term investment goals, and you want to have capital preservation. So maybe it's even better not to invest at all. OK. Thank you, Maxim, for joining us. Appreciate your insights. Absolutely. It was a pleasure to be. All right. That was digital finance CEO Max Nurov. That's it for all about Bitcoin. I'm your host, Christine Lee. Join us tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in New York for First Mover, your first look at the day's global crypto news headlines. You're watching Coindesk TV.